So welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. Of course, we wish it was in person, but maybe this gives additional folks an opportunity to attend who wouldn't be able to get out in person tonight. So we'll just, we'll hope for that. Before we get started, we do have a virtual event code of conduct. We just always want to make sure that um, any event we do is respectful of the panelists as well as the communities that we're talking about. Um, we want everyone to feel safe and included and uh, respected during our events. So if there is any um, any nonsense, I'm a mom of four, so I'm allowed to call it nonsense. If there's any nonsense, um, you will be removed from the event. And uh, depending on what's happening, you may also be excluded from future events. So let's just keep that in mind and let's just treat everybody the way that you would wanna be treated. Everyone who's here tonight is here because they care about our community and we wanna make sure that that comes through. One thing I should mention is we are leaving time at the end of the event for questions um, from our, for our panelists, but we're going to do all of that through the Q and A button and through the chat uh, function. So Tia and I will be keeping track of the chat and through the Q and A. So you don't have to wait till the end. If you're listening to a presentation, you have a question, just go ahead and throw it in the chat box or throw it in the Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll get to it. Um, we're we definitely left some time at the end. We figured there would be questions, um, so we want to make sure that we get to as many as possible. But again, we'll T and I will be monitoring the chat um, and the Q and A box as we go along. So um, just throw your questions in there, and we'll we'll try to make sure that they get answered for you. And then before we go any further, we do want to acknowledge that um, we are bringing you this presentation tonight from land that is the ancestral home of the people of the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee, meaning people building a longhouse, and that this land is still important to this living culture and the descendants of these original peoples. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. We're really excited about um, this event and we do have um, a range of different voices as we talk about um, disinvestment, um, and demolition as public policy, what that means and how it's shaped our communities. Um, so tonight we're really excited to be uh, joined by Brandi Barrett, who's a lifelong resident of the Fruit Belt neighborhood in Buffalo, New York. Her roots were uniquely planted here in the 1930s when her great grandparents became homeowners in the same neighborhood. The legacy, work ethic, and commitment to community and the neighborhood that her family is known for is what drives Brandy's passions today. We're also going to be joined by Mark Paradowski, who is an Eastside native from the Walden ba Bailey neighborhood. He earned his bachelor's degree in computer science and his MBA from Canisius College in the Hamlin Park Historic District, where he now lives. As a neighborhood activist and preservationist married to an urban planner, Mark likes to use a data-driven approach to catalog the successes and failures of the East Side that he grew up with. And finally, we're excited to have Jason Knight with us tonight. Jason is an associate professor at SUNY Buffalo State, where he teaches courses in urban planning and urban geography. His experience as a planner includes work across the public, private, and academic sectors. He considers himself a pracademic, using statistical research methods and systems thinking as guiding frameworks to studying our region's housing and land systems and policies. With friend, collaborator, and co-conspirator, Dr. Russell Weaver, they have published on the city's demolition program, the Clean Sweep program, and unequal access to walkable neighborhoods. They recently co-authored an Another Voice editorial in the Buffalo News that called for a revision of the city's charter founded upon the principles of social, racial, gender, and economic justice that actually democratizes and socializes, among other things, the city's land use and housing decisions. His recent work includes the Erie County analysis of impediments to fair housing, advancing housing, and due to be delivered in draft form tomorrow to Lisk Buffalo, a housing needs assessment for Erie and Niagara counties. So I think you can see this is going to be a pretty robust uh, panel and a pretty robust discussion. Um, but before we get into it, and you can tell by the panelists, like we're probably going to get kind of wonky tonight. There's going to be statistics. There's you know going to be our values. It's going to be a whole thing. Um, but we always like to foreground our work um, in community, and this will be a little bit of a different. Um, event for us tonight. There won't be anyone here talking to you necessarily about architectural styles or national register criteria um, or tax credits. Um, we're really going to be talking about the heart of preservation, which is what it means to live in a community. 
And the way that we practice preservation here at PBN, it doesn't mean just fighting for buildings as objects. That's not really what we do. We're fighting to preserve people's homes, their communities, to make sure that they have the opportunity to be rooted in place in ways that best support their mental and physical health. And I just wanted, before we really got into it, to just kind of um, just came across these images a good friend uh, sent uh, recently this week, actually this image um, on my left, I don't know how it looks on your screen. Um, this is a Charles Birchfield painting, House Wreckers in June from 1931. Um, uh, a watercolor and charcoal on paper painting of a housing demolition. And I think it's really kind of a haunting image. And then this is a poem by Lucille Clifton, Lot's Wife, 1988. Each of these weeds is a day I climb the stair at 254 Purdy Street and look into a mirror to see if I was really there. I was there, I am there in the thousand days, the weeds. And these weeds were 11 Harwood Place that daddy bought expecting it to hold our name forever against the spin of the world. Our name is spinning away in the wind, blowing across the vacant lots of Buffalo, New York that were my girlhood homes. Sales, I hear them calling, sales, we thought we would live forever. And I look back like Lot's wife, wedded to her weeds and turned to something surer than salt and write this, yes, I promise, yes, we will. And we just wanted to start there tonight, again, to remember that while we're gonna talk about um, public policy, what we're really talking about are people's homes and their lives. And um, I can say as an urban planner, there's a lot of urban planning that makes decisions for people. We just wanna make sure that people have information and decisions as they make decisions about their own lives and their own communities. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brandi Barrett to give her presentation. Thanks, Jesse. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Jesse said, my name is Brandy Barrett. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the Fruit Belt. Uh, my family um, established themselves here um, within the 1930s. Um, some say it was the late 20s. Uh, from both of my relatives recall, um, the most accurate answer I'm getting is, is in the early 30s. Um, so we're gonna use that. So in this picture, you see uh, from right to left um, is my great grandfather, Flannery Jones, uh, my great grandmother, his wife, Hattie Jones, my grandfather, Hilliard Smith, and my grandmother, Juanita Smith. And this is where it all started. So as my memory call and stories have been told, I'm sharing with you a brief capture of my family's history living in a fruit boat. Preparing for this meeting, I learned through my aunt, our family roots were deeper than what I had known. As my grandfather's mother, Hilliard, mother Emma Smith also lived on Orange Street um, prior to her departing to Ohio. Next slide. 42 Mulberry is how it all started. That was our first family home in the fruit boat. Hattie Fitzpatrick Jones, also known as Nana, was a biracial Irish, Native American and African American woman from Pulaski, Pulaski Tennessee. My great grandfather, Flannery Jones, also known as Papa, was Native American born in Oklahoma and lived with his parents on a reservation. Papa had grew up fishing and farming his entire life. Nana and Papa married at a very early age, Nana 13, Papa 23. During World War II, my great grandparents moved to Buffalo, New York due to the booming job economy and manufacturing and railroad networks. After living on Sycamore Street with distant family with their two baby girls, they moved to the Fruit Belt. What attracted them was the was what attracted them to the Fruit Belt were the trees and the rich soil for vegetation. As mentioned, my papa was a farmer by nature. He spent countless hours growing, picking, pruning, 
cucumbers, collards, peppers, potatoes, peas, almost any other veggie, you, veg, vegetable you can grow in this climate. My great grandparents prided themselves on being self-reliant, sustainable hard workers. Partnership, commitment, strength, and family are all words that come to mind that help lead to the next generation. Next slide. The fruit belt in the 50s and 60s described, was described as a place where families felt empowered and connected and protected to one another. The neighborhood was full of mixed use buildings that served as food resources, employment resources, places to worship and socialize. In this picture, um, from right to left is my uncle Brian, my mother Brenda, her sister Beverly, my uncle Mark, and the youngest of the family, um, Elaine Smith, my, my aunt with the heart on her shirt. Next slide. My uncle Mark told me a story as he remembered his first um, memories on Peach Street, where there were two corner stores on the corner of Peach and East North. One of those stores was a dairy store that he worked in. He remembered the neighborhood being full of vibrancy and economy. We didn't have to travel outside the neighborhood for resources and supplies. Many neighbors in the community had gardens and would share and exchange goods instead of going to the supermarket. He recalled watching basketball on a colored TV for the first time at a neighbor's house along with other childhood friends. And then this picture here, um, to the, the picture on the right is June of 1969, standing in front of the house that I currently live in, 285 Peach Street. Um, and my mother was graduating from East High School. And then the house next door, uh, which is still there, looks a lot different from today. As you can imagine, um, through the through the change and um, growth through the through the community, the picture to the left um, is a picture of my aunts and my mother spending one of their first Christmases um, at two eighty five Peach Street. Next slide. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, the fruit belt continued to thrive. However, the lush gardens were now becoming vacant lots, still filled with children playing kickball, football, and other childhood games. The housing stock felt more dense. It felt more connected. Um, I remember many times growing up in the fruit belt, my mother would always wear a Polaroid camera around her neck <laughs> and she would take pictures of us throughout the summer and different buildings and different experiences. And I remember so vividly uh, going up to the park um, and at the time it was War Memorial Stadium. And she grabbed me and my friend Aaliyah who lived next door. And she said, guys, stand in front of the, stand in front of the building because it's not gonna be here anymore. And we were being fooly and making faces. And here I am today, almost 30 years later, sharing these stories, sharing these pictures and of this building that is no longer here today. This remind, looking at these stories, looking at these pictures also reminds me of the families that used to be here, you know, raising my daughter now who is six years old. Um, she doesn't have the opportunity. The opportunity isn't there um, anymore where kids were once filled in the streets playing and laughing and joking. Um, so this is why I wanted to show this. And this is a little picture. Um, the bottom picture is a picture of me um, coming from church or going to church on an Easter Sunday, um, which is something that we celebrate. It was part of our culture um, in the fruit belt, looking, you know, looking forward to holidays, looking forward to sharing these experiences um, with your family, with your community, and just wanting to know well, who wore it best. Um, that was part of our culture. That was part of community. Next slide. In closing, myself and my family have spent years witnessing and experiencing disinvestment. You can see it in the current state the neighborhood is in. You can see it through the expansion of the medical corridor. 
You can see it in the purchase of land and the changing use of the neighborhood without meaningful participation and input by our neighbors and long life residents who are increasingly becoming displaced by this growth. I fear the long-term impact could result in the disappearance of such an important place in the city of Buffalo. My intention is to, is to lead by example with the hope that my daughter will find the same spirit and intuition and continue to grow the legacy our fam family history has placed. And here um, again is 42 Mulberry Street, which now is vacant in 2021. Um, it's a vacant lot, um, nothing is there. Um, so we just have, and it's a little bit blurry, um, but in the middle are the antique rose bushes. Um, my great grandparents, Nana and Papa, were pruned. Um, so that is the only memory um, that I have left from being on Mulberry Street. <laughs> and to tell you these stories and to recreate some of these memories have been bittersweet for me um, and my family. So we live, love, and laugh through this um, because it has been devastating <laughs> um and it has and it's been but we're, we're here for the fight we're here for the long run and we're we're not going anywhere so we continue to remind ourselves respond to the call of need and restore um, the culture and the richness this community once had thank you Randy, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing the story of your community with us. And I think it reminds us all of kind of why we why we do this work. So thanks so much. And um, a reminder to everyone else, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll get to everything at the end. And now I'm going to turn um, the presentation over to Jason and let you share your screen um, and, we'll, and we'll keep going. But remember, if you have any questions you want to make sure get answered, just put them in the chat. T and I are paying attention. Great, thanks. I um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to to gather with everyone here, and, and you know, and, and Brandy's story in particular is, is is you know in many ways similar to my story. Although I live in the suburbs, um, I am the result of uh, my family's suburban flight um, in the '50s and '60s. Um, but my, you know, I'm not. Uh, I am a lifelong Western New Yorker who just happens to be. Um, just happens to be in academics in this community, both at the school I went to for an undergraduate degree and across town from the school I got two other degrees. Um, you know, my family story is, is traces right to the east side as well. Um, my great grandparents emigrated to this country um, in the 1920s, early 1920s. There's, there's some census and actually newspaper story that, that has their, their name in it. Um, over to 56 Kilhoffer, which is um, one block actually away from Wendy Street, which we'll come back to um, as we, we plow through this presentation. Um, I think I'm here because I had this fascination for a long period of time with demolition. And, and you know, as I really try to understand how it is we arrived at the current state of affairs in the city of Buffalo, I went through this long process of sort of what I refer to as and teach, try to teach students this concept of systems thinking and really trying to understand that when we see an outcome on the ground, um, Planners love to rush to apply a band-aid to that outcome instead of rushing to understand how that outcome comes to be. And so that we can think about not addressing the single issue with a band-aid, but address the system that created it in the first place. So, um, so I went through this fascination with demolition and then I moved into vacancy and abandonment and foreclosure and tax foreclosure auctions. And you know, I helped found the, the land bank when I was at the county before I got into academics. And I think those are the reasons why I'm, I'm here. Um, I am not a preservationist, which I sort of cautioned um, Jesse and others before this started. I am a, maybe a little bit too um, technocratic and rational for that. I mean, I appreciate and love architecture and culture and history as much as anyone else, but um, maybe somewhat to Brandy's point, um, I'm a people first planner, a social equity planner. And I, you know, my, my, my role, I think, in, in, in the work that I do, or at least the work I try to do, um, really tries to connect um, our policy solutions, first and foremost, to people and secondarily to buildings. And I, you know, those things are connected clearly. Um, so we've done a lot of work, Rusty and I, um, you know, I, I sort of in the introduction, you know, Rusty's a, a lifelong friend. I mean, we, we met a long time ago in the PhD program at UB. Um, our families are close, um, you know, and we are, you know, a, a sort of collaborative team, but also we sort of think ourselves as a little bit as co-conspirators. Um, and agitators, you know, trying to push, um, you know, ideas that have, that have lost some traction in the region. 
um, back to the fore. Um, and that includes the, another voice piece that we did on the sort of idea of democratizing and socializing land use decisions and maybe thinking about changing our charter, you know, stuff that's really maybe far, too far out there for us to really grasp, but really tries to push the envelope to, to get us to this idea of systems change. Um, and so demolitions were early a part of really my, my main interest in what was happening, how we arrived at where we were. So, you know, my, my intent really here is not to reinvent the wheel. There will be no our values here. There will be no statistical models here. Um, I, I, it's kind of one of those deals where that's the kind of stuff that you roll out at academic conferences where people in the room are other academics and they might care about that. Um, I think, and I try to teach students to think about reading journal articles and understanding the framing and the conclusions and the next steps. Um, and if you don't care about how they arrived at those conclusions, that's fine, as long as you know that there's value in that. Um, so that's the, the, the sort of attempt taken here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit real quickly about the role of demolition and the need for it um, in, the, in, in the sort of broader public policy arena. Um, I want to talk specifically about this sort of concept of strategic demolition and rip off. Um, Alan Mollick's work and Alan, I think, is my, my I sort of lean into a lot of his work um, because I think he's just got the, the lifelong experience that, that's proven to be um, to be very useful for everybody. Look at a little bit at the five and five demo program in, in somewhat detail, like try to understand how it is that it was developed, the, the, the political climate that, that resulted in that, that strategy. Um, and then we'll come back and really sort of understand, um, you know, how it was implemented, what were the outcomes, and then we'll circle back to this idea that um, it really wasn't rooted in the strategic demolition strategies that Malik lays out in his work um, for a number of reasons. And I sort of take a kick at what I think are some of the things that are critically important in our city moving forward. Um, you know, a lot of the damage has been done. Um, a lot of the vacancy exists. The, the market demand for that isn't as great as it needs to be to achieve um, some reuse strategies across the board. Um, so I want to think a little bit about how we move what Malik says, strategic incrementalism, right? Baby steps towards solutions rather than being um, sort of paralyzed by the scope and scale of the challenge. So, you know, Alan Malik's work, um, I, I, you know, there's, there's people in the, in, the, in the audience here that I know that I've worked with um, in, in many different sort of arenas in the, in the region. I always try to tell people if you really want a good practical approach to neighborhood decline and disinvestment and strategies we can use in those places, um, Malik's the, the go-to person. He's, uh, his work is um, fundamentally key, I think, to most communities' needs. Um, he's got, Alan's got to be in his late 70s or early 80s. I mean, the guy was the, the community planning director and community development director in, um, I believe, Trenton, New Jersey. Um, he's just the go-to guy for this kind of stuff. So we tend to lean heavily into his work. Um, his argument is the same argument that I make, and this is the challenge for maybe some people in the room is preservation really isn't a yes or no proposition. Do we do it or don't do it? Um, it's a necessary part of public policy. It's unfortunate. We can sort of agree in that reality, uh, but it is necessary. Um, it's necessary for two critical reasons. One is we in this region and other regions as well um, have a ever growing supply of increasingly vacant structures and the market demand for those structures that is in many cases um, absent or non-existent, right? Outside of what we've seen in the last few years, you know, um, at least since I've been in the in the in the arena here a little bit, um, you know, the overtaking of, of vacant abandoned structures and lots by speculators, milkers, flippers, those types, right? Um, and then there's the human component here, right? And I, I think this is important to recognize that, you know, the failure to do demolition, right? The failure to undertake this demolition. Um, imposes a number of really consequential and negatively impactful social impacts, as well as economic impacts and environmental impacts on place, right? On the neighborhoods of people, as I sort of always say, people still live in these places, right? Let's, let's be conscious of the reality of what's happening here. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, really demolition is, is something that can't be avoided. It's a necessary component of, of, of public policy. Now, the, the, the question becomes, I think, how do we do it, right? What, what is the, the most appropriate way to undertake demolition that achieves something beyond just the physical act of removing a given structure from a given geography, right? And so in Alan's work that's, that's cited here, and, and I definitely would, would recommend anyone to take a quick peek at it, um, he makes 10, 10 key points, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll go through these. I think they're important. 
I underline the things that I think are important in each of these 10 things because we're going to come back to a number of them and try to understand where, where they were absent in the five and five pro program. So he makes uh, these, you know, on this, on this slide, these five key points, right? That any large scale demolition program, which the five and five was, um, should adopt transparent and efficient procedures to evaluate which buildings should be targeted for demolition. So we identify what should be targeted, critical, critical first step. Um, we establish criteria for what gets demolished, right? So another critical sort of next step in this thing, um, that there's some decision tree or process under which we make demolition decisions that importantly for I think a lot of you here, um, engages with neighborhood residents, stakeholders and organizations that are impacted by demolition. So, um, you know, it should not, should be something that just a local government and the planners in the room get to determine what goes and when. Um, that it should be like a lot of things in the planning world. It should be based on public engagement and sort of some level of democ democratizing the decision making that comes with it. Um, that we should, you know, this one is sort of misses the mark in Buffalo and we'll come back to it. Um, that we need a number of changes at the state level, right? Local governments are really handcuffed in a lot of ways to doing demolition in a manner that is efficient and effective um, and equitable. And some of that is um, really archaic policy at the, at the state level. Um, that, that maybe thwarts our ability to demolish things more than we, we, we need to. Um, the fifth one is, um, what do we do with the lots that are left behind, which is kind of my current fascination um, and, you know, work with, with some organizations around the city who can't get their hands on um, vacant lots, but also in neighborhoods that see vacant lots become places where we find refrigerators and tires and empty couches and those types of things, right? So those are critical. Um, we need some sort of stabilization program or system in place um, so that when we think about demolition or, or lot reuse or any of those sort of things, that it's actually tied to some broader policy or strategy that, that guides the decisions. Um, again, the number seven is, is, is a state level policy in, in question related to um, some of the statutes and regulations that impact demolition. In New York State, we have these really, so some of these really archaic rules are like the, um, the asbestos reporting fee um, that adds relatively unnecessarily, a, a, essentially a penalty to local government that they have to pay just to report that they demolished a unit that had asbestos in it, right? It just drives up the price and reduces the number that can be um, demolished. Um, so again, eight more, more state tools to recover cost of demolition, things that local governments have been pushing for. Nine is an old um, attempt um, and policy passed in the early part of the, the 20, that 2012, 2013 era. Um, and then, you know, leverage as much resources as you possibly can um, to support demolition, but it has to be in conjunction with local stabilization and development strategies, right? So those that are really familiar with the methods and means of demolition and the outcomes in Buffalo should recognize a lot of um, absence of these strategies or these sort of recommendations in the way that demolition has been undertaken um, in the city of Buffalo. So in the last paper that we, sort of ended our run on demolition in the city of Buffalo, we made the argument essentially that if we look at Allen's 10, um, 10 strategies or 10, um, 10 criteria for strategic demolition, really they're broken into two distinct components um, from our perspective, right? One is the critical important program design and implementation actions, right? So, um, those are steps one through three on the list that I showed five and six. I'll come through them one more time. Um, these are important because essentially these are the steps that local governments can take immediately without needing any legislative action above their sort of pay grade, if you will, right? That they don't need to sort of turn to state level governments or federal level governments to do things because they have these powers inherently under state statute or local charter or something to that effect, right? Um, and then four and um, seven through 10 are the regulatory actions that local governments should partner with um, higher levels of government to change the rules under which demolition essentially takes place. Both the reporting rules, the funding rules, um, the title rules, those types of um, issues. So when we think about, from my perspective, when we think about the most effective way to really design um, and implement quickly a de demolition program, it's really those first three, steps and then number five and six, right? So if we think about how we would undertake a demolition program today, if we were to do it all over again, um, we would think about these five things as critical components to designing and implementing a functional strategic demolition strategy, right? So the first is, again, back to number one, adopt transparent and efficient procedures to evaluate which buildings should be targeted for demolitions, um, establish priorities, um, 
the direct resources to areas that contain features or ongoing activities that can leverage the value of targeting building a removal, right? So this is this is the sort of preservation point that I think gets sort of lost in the sauce a little bit when we talk about just demolishing things. Um, one of the key values in demolition strategy and, and coming up with a, an actual codified plan is actually thinking long term about what it means to leverage existing assets in existing communities, right? So whether that is something like the Broadway market or a neighborhood church or you know, the central terminal, or whatever the case may be, those assets should be leveraged um, and considered when we think about how it is that we demolish or what we demolish in any given geography, right? Um, community engagement, this sort of third point is critically important, right? I've had, I can't tell you how many nonprofits have come to me and asked me how they get lots from the city or how they uncork this challenge or how do we do this or how do we do that. Um, the challenge really is we don't really have this really clear process and transparency in city hall as it relates to not just the decision making that drives demolition, but we don't have really a, a strategic public engagement apparatus that says, um, you know, here's what we're going to demolish. What do you think, right? So we don't really have this sort of relationship between the community that's impacted most by demolition and the people doing the demolition, right? So we have this sort of break in this in this conversation, right? Um, the fifth one is where my brain is right now, which is we have all these lots and how do we address those, right? And what, how do we get them to be something beyond an obstacle or challenge and something that looks more like a stabilization tool or an, and an asset for a community? And then the last one is um, a broad range neighborhood stabilization strategy that will, that's linked both to demolition and the vacant lots and all the other strategies that you have in these sort of places where we find relatively high levels of, of neighborhood distress, right? So. It brings us to this quick point that everyone here should have a good grasp on, right? Which is demolition didn't cause the problem. Demolition was the result or the end game, the last sort of gambit in the in the long run decline and disinvestment of, of our city. Um, you know, the period after World War II was a period of substantial negative changes to both the city and the region. Um, and so we can lump them under really two key categories. One is the, the long run process of um, the suburbanization of largely white affluent middle class households out to the suburbs, um, taking advantage of, of uh, the federal mortgage program um, that essentially privileged whiteness and discounted or discriminated against people of color, right? So people of color get stuck behind in these neighborhoods that get disinvested because the white population is fleeing. Money isn't backfilling into these neighborhoods to support property maintenance and ongoing economic activity. And they, the process of suburbanization really contributes to the downfall of a lot of, uh, of our city's neighborhoods. And that's happening sort of simultaneously with the slow trickle, you know, beginning in the 1950s. And then, you know, the sort of ramp up of, of the industrialization and the massive permanent structural shift in our regional economy. Um, moving away from, you know, metals and, and manufacturing and industry um, towards a general broader national and global economy fundamentally about deploying uh, manufacturing and, and productivity overseas to cheap locations and keeping the knowledge and service economy here predicated on higher education and human capital, um, things that weren't common in Buffalo. Um, you know, my, my, my father walked across the graduation stage on a Saturday and went to work at Conrail um, on a Monday, you know, that was the sort of trajectory of, of, of the blue collar ethos um, in, in, in Western New York in the 50s, 60s and 70s. You went and got a job as a skilled or unskilled laborer, whatever the case may be. Um, so we couldn't turn the ship around when deindustrialization happened because our economy was just over leveraged in essentially low skilled manufacturing and, and labor based jobs, right? So what we get in Buffalo essentially is this long run process in the city whereby population and households continue to flee because jobs flee primarily. Um, and the wealthy households fled because they could, right? And we built them a highway system and gave them the mortgages to allow them to do that, right? So what we get in you know, sort of highlighted in the, the table here is the sort of start year 2007, the start year of the five and five demo program when the, when the demolition, uh, when the vacancy rate was estimated at about 21%. Now these are one year it's the only sort of wonky point here. These are one year ACS estimates. So they come with somewhat of a um, error rate attached to them. So it could be two to 3% in some cases. Um, and by 2012, the, the rate had dropped, but it had, if you look closely, um, it sort of ticked back up from 2010. The 2010 number here 
is the actual decennial census complete 100% count. So that number, and if you go back to 2000, you'll see that those numbers are actually the same. So from 2000's decennial census to 2010, the vacancy rate didn't change. Now, if you look at the table a little bit differently, you'll see that the number of units certainly changed, right? We, we decreased the number of units largely through demolition, but we had very little impact on the overall demol or the overall vacancy rate, which in another way to think about it is really it becomes a zero sum game, right? You're chasing your tail and you're just being able to keep up with the outflow of, of households as, um, as you demolish units, right? And this becomes part of the mathematical challenge that's embedded in the, the, the five and five programs um, attempt to get the vacancy rate closer to 5%, right? So the physical challenge, right? This, this, uh, this sort of declining disinvestment that we were seeing in the east side wasn't sort of hidden in plain sight. It was pretty well jammed into the face of, of the public. It, news stories, um, you know, were pretty commonplace around, you know, we need to demolish this neighborhood conditions in this place are, um, are, are declining or falling apart. Um, you know, you get, squabbling and infighting between politicians pointing fingers over challenges that they're seeing in the in the in their neighborhoods and in their districts um, you get residents that feel like nothing is actually working so they see demolition but they don't see improvement um, they see houses being boarded that eventually get demolished because the boarded houses don't get addressed either um, then they see oh they're demolishing houses that's good but then the vacant lot becomes a place where again refrigerators garbage tires show up right so like they don't there's never this sort of long run sort of um, sort of exhale um, for neighborhood residents in certain places where they feel like the, the policies that are being implemented are really resulting in um, positive change in their place, right? It just seems like more um, expenditure of public dollars to, to really do something that looks a lot like disinvestment rather than reinvestment. And so this is the challenge, right? And then it brings us to this sort of flashpoint in Buffalo, right? If, for those of you that are around and were paying attention in 2007, um, this is the this is the point. This is the this is how we got to the five and five demo program, right? Um, as I said earlier, Wendy is parallel to um, to Bailey near Bailey in Genesee. The city of Buffalo at this time is basically responding to arson fires pretty regularly, right? Um, so you get an arson fire on Wendy at one twenty Wendy. Um, it's on a block that basically. Um, the city had demolished about 17% of the units already. So, you know, the likelihood that, that a fire on Wendy Street on that day was, was in a vacant unit um, was pretty likely, right? It was pretty likely. So the, the firefighters responded, Mark Reed, um, you know, freak accident, chimney falls on him, um, spends almost two months in the hospital um, gets his leg amputated, has massive head injuries and injuries on, and, and, and fractures all over the upper part of his body. Um, and people went bananas, right? So it's kind of a sad sort of indictment of what raises the public's ire around, um, around the quality and condition of our neighborhoods. When someone in a uniform gets hurt, then it's a problem. And then it gets become a, becomes a codified plan. It becomes a codified strategy. And we throw a lot of money at it. Um, and so back to my point earlier about, hey, people still live here and we should be concerned about caring for those people. Um, this plan was long overdue, right? It was long overdue. Um, so the idea that it's responsive to the needs of the firefighting community is clearly and undeniably necessary. Um, but it, was, it just seems to be too late to really stem the tide of much. Um, so you had, you know, if you read the news stories between June, July, and August of that year, they were pretty critical and pretty cutting. Um, you had council members squabbling and blaming each other and pointing fingers, um, blaming years of what they called self-serving leadership, right? You had the police, you had the fire union screaming from every rooftop that it possibly could that the issue needs to be addressed. The firefighters' mothers in the paper all the time granting interviews saying, like, this is not acceptable. Um, so what you had was, a, a you know, Mayor Brown, to first term mayor, you know, basically, I think about a year and a half into his first term, gets saddled with this massive challenge. And he, to his credit, he knew going in, he campaigned recognizing that this was a severe challenge, right? Um, but he put together this five and five demolition program in just under two months. And I, you know, that's a pretty record pace for, for public policy development. Um, and so in some ways, it was a really politically expedient policy 
Um, and I and and there's some, I think there's some blame to be to be had in, in terms of how quickly it was rolled out because it didn't get to the strategy component of the demolition, which we'll talk about. Um, but it really simply saw it. It's a very short brief. Um, you know, really good data in it, really good information. It basically sought simply to, to remove 5,000 structures in five years, right? Um, pretty simple, straightforward approach. Um, again, like every single demolition program that's codified and, and passed and adopted, it, it said simply, we have an oversupply of vacant units and we need to reduce the supply, right? So the, the attempt here was essentially, um, to reduce the 15.7% in 2000 in the 2000 census to closer to 5% in over those five years. And, you know, anybody who knows the data knows that that's a massively heavy lift, right? To get to from 15% or 16% to five. It turns out again, to the mayor's credit um, and, you know, no, to no fault of his own, this gets rolled out in 2007, right? When the sort of whispers of a, impending housing collapse are coming. And so when you look back at the data that I showed, you see um, you see the vacancy rate actually go up by 2010, estimated to go up by 2010. Um, and it did, it went back up. And then it went back up again by 2012, mainly because the overflow of, of vacant units was, was too much for the demolition program to bring that number um, down. So the program also was predicated on the rather substantially large pool of, of money that was actually unallocated, right? So it required or called for $60 million in state money, which the state had not promised, um, 15 million in federal money, which apparently the feds had not promised, the city money, which they obviously controlled, and then some a community city sort of match. Um, so there is a point in here that, that says, you know, philanthropy should help or could help or something to that effect. And the city would match a dollar for dollar up to a half uh, uh, or up to 2.5 million dollars. Um, so we had, you know, a really quickly developed plan based on, you know, some some obvious need, but also a, a, a politically expedient challenge. So, you know, when we look back at the the plan, what we see is um, we see it fall short of the 5,000 structures, which you know um, is not. You know, we weren't surprised when we got the data and sort of coded it and mapped it and counted it that it didn't get to 5,000. I mean, the city was on pace, um, you know, the, in the years before that, we're doing about 1,000 a year anyway without this plan. So they were they were on the sort of path or trajectory anyway towards 1,000 a year, but it just didn't get there. Um, they did a lot of demolition in the east side in the area that you see on the map here, this area that's clustered in, in red in sort of pinkish tones here. Um, you know, predominantly in the East Delavan and East Side planning communities where the vast majority of demolitions took place. Unfortunately, again, you know, I'm not, it's not a criticism of the mayor or the policy, but by 2012, the end of 2012, the end of that five-year period, um, the vacancy rate was back up to close to 18%. And, you know, I would argue that much of that increase is, is due to housing market concerns and the, the housing foreclosure crisis and things like that. Um, so if you look at the table, we're down, you know, we're down below 15.7 and we're at 13.9 now, but we're still above, you know, even the 1990 rate. So we still have this sort of challenge where we can't demolish enough fast enough um, to get the rate down. So it becomes a sort of really um, significant challenge. The lifelong story here on the east side um, in Buffalo as a whole is these are the units, these are the vacant lots currently in the city of Buffalo. And it does, I mean, it, it sort of looks like a lot, but when you think about the number, um, the number of vacant lots in the city is just over 16,000. Um, the total number of parcels in the city is about 92,000. So, you know, we're approaching essentially one in six lots in the city of Buffalo being vacant, right? The vacancy is disproportionately on the east side of Buffalo and communities of, uh, well, in neighborhoods that were originally either redlined or the next worst neighborhood condition, which was yellow, right? So the places, those two neighborhoods saw zero investment, right? Just because it was redlined didn't mean that the other three neighborhoods, the yellow, the green, and the, and the, and the blue saw investment. Um, the yellow neighborhoods, the sort of next most risky saw almost no investment, right? And that no investment was a large swath of the east side, um, mainly because initial housing quality wasn't as great as it was in other places. 
um, neighborhood conditions, the, the sort of criteria that went into the, the mapping of those, of those blocks in those neighborhoods um, took into account things like access or proximity to, you know, less than favorable land uses, factories, rail lines, those types of things, right? So you had the conditions where this type of thing under was undertaken. Now we have, um, so we have sort of backing up to the 16,000 lots point, you know, about 7,200 just res formerly residential lots are publicly controlled. So the city of Buffalo is essentially the steward of about 7,200 vacant lots that are, I call publicly owned. I refuse to call them city owned. I think that delegates too much power and control to the city. Um, they are publicly owned, right? We are the public. Um, we collectively pay for the demolitions. We collectively pay for the costs and the impacts. So we should collectively have a decision um, or have a seat at the table when a decision is made about the reuse is sort of where I'm going. Um, so our argument, you know, thinking about why the five and five really didn't get to those objectives. Um, one is, you know, clearly that it was underfunded, right? It didn't have the promised money set up for, it wasn't a million dollars, hundred million dollars sitting on the table for the mayor to use to demolish the program. So I, you know, his ambition um, is, is something that should be lauded. I think he recognized the challenge and the problem and did the best he could to try to push it forward. And I think that's admirable in the public policy arena. Um, but just not having the money was a key critical um, challenge for, for seeing it through. Um, so when we think about the strategic actions that I said before that were things that local governments controlled inherently and at the outset, um, this is where we think that they missed, right? Because there really doesn't appear to be much strategy in the, in the housing demolition um, arena in Buffalo. Much of the way housing was demolished um, was the squeaky wheel approach, right? A neighbor called and complained enough times the city said, well, just go take it down, right? Just go take it down. Or it became an immediate public health threat, public safety threat, and it had to be taken down. So it was an arson and half the building was gone. Um, or there's, you know, there's, there's some criminal element uh, related to it and it needs to go. But generally, there was very little strategy connected to it up until the five and five. And I, we would sort of argue that in reading the five and five and then subsequent sort of analysis of what happened after, there was very little um, strategy within the five and five, right? So um, there was no sort of thinking about the strategic actions one and two. There was no real prioritization of, of, of specific buildings to be demolished in specific areas. It was, it was still rather willy-nilly. There was, there was a point in there about, well, near school buildings or for economic development purposes or something to that effect, but there was no real um, list, right? There's no prioritized list. Um, there was no participation, right? The public didn't get an opportunity to sit down. The stakeholders, you know, preservationists, affordable housing um, organizations, um, to sit down at the table and say, okay, what do you, what is the city thinking about demolishing? What does it want to demolish? And here's what we think um, our thoughts are on this on this process, right? So, you know, getting something done in under eight weeks is there's no room in that time frame for for public participation. Um, we have no really, there's no document that exists that says we are going to strategically demolish these units in this geography for this reason. And so essentially what you got in this, this quote in this slide is really is from another work that looked at, and I, I apologize if, if I fail to remember who's, whose work it is, um, but one we've cited, um, the, the city just essentially um, demolished buildings where it was politically expedient, which is the number of phone calls piled up about 123, you know, kill offer, and that was enough to, to, to result in a, a demolition crew showing up. Um, so it, it, it created this sort of random scattershot approach to demolition that resulted in this very random and scattershot approach to, to vacant lot um, creation in the city that now when we look at the east side, what we see is something that doesn't really look all that random. It looks clustered, but that's a an artifact of the process over long periods of time. Um, and then the, the last point that I think is, is important here for us thinking, how, how do you move forward? Um, if that is, is in fact a, a sort of goal here, um, it, the demolition plan can't be a standalone document disconnected from broader planning policies, right? It can't just be, we need to demolish buildings, right? It has to be connected to other plans, programs, and strategies, right? Those strategic things that Malik lays out in bullet items five and six, right? Um, so rather than just demolish buildings, um, we need to think about what happens after the fact. We need to think about what's going to happen um, that leads to reinvestment in those places. 
Um, so there needs to be a little bit more um, effort undertaken into that, right? So, you know, my, you know, sitting down today and just putting this sort of last slide together, I, I a lot of this might seem like the same thing over and over and over again, but I think they're distinctly different components here. Um, first and foremost, I think what we lack in the city, and I think from my understanding is in theory may be happening or may come to the fore at some point, um, is we lack, you know, for, for a large city of 250,000 people um, with some severe neighborhood challenges, but also some, some really good neighborhood assets, we don't have neighborhood level plans in the city of Buffalo that really guide decision making. And it's really, you know, for, for a city that touts itself as the best planned city in America, right? It's, it seems really stunning to me that we can't even get ourselves to actually come up with neighborhood level plans to treat each neighborhood as its own context um, that needs its own policy solutions, right? So a comprehensive plan is not that, brownfield area plan is not that, LWRP is not that, right? We, we, we fundamentally have tripped over um, and given up on what I think is the critical thing that we need the most, right? Inside that plan, or maybe standalone, however you sort of think about this, um, we need a strategic demolition plan that, that that links to the things that Malik said, right? So if we're going to keep doing demolition, which clearly we are, um, we need to engage the people that are impacted by demolition. We need to have a strategy um, attached to that. We need to um, we need to connect it to all these other plans, a neighborhood plan, for example. Um, we need a lot of reuse and management strategy, things that we've been pushing for. Um, Rusty and I wrote a resolution um, for the City of Buffalo Council asking the council to seat a community board to review um, vacant lot reuse in the city and come up with recommendations to pass to real estate law and OSP um, to, to, to think about how it is that we reuse these lots. We can't just keep creating thousands and thousands of, of vacant lots with no reuse strategy. Um, that resolution was ba based off of Mike Licurdo's resolution on participatory budgeting, which is let the people that are impacted by the decisions be part of the decision making. Um, and we had a Zoom call yesterday with Council Member um, uh, Rivera, and we, we've worked pretty closely with, with Mitch Nowakowski, Council Member Nowakowski, um, on that resolution. And we're going to try to see if we can get some traction with some other um, council members that are interested in, in, in the idea. Um, we need a better land disposition strategy in the city. Um, a lot of nonprofits have always come to me and say, well, how can I get city? Where do I find lots that the city owns? Because there's no map, um, and then how do I get it? Um, currently, what we have is a land disposition strategy in the city of Buffalo that functions something like this. Oh, you have money? How much will you give me for the lot? And that's it, right? So, and if you can't pay, then tough. And if you can't pay and you're a nonprofit housing organization that really is trying to tackle a major housing crisis in the city and you can't pay us $50,000 for a lot, sorry. Um, and my point to Council Member Rivera yesterday, and again, when we met with him last, um, last year, was you have the asset. The asset is the subsidy. The vacant lot is the asset. The vacant lot is already a sunk cost subsidy, which is you've already paid for the subsidy. It doesn't require you to have more money to, to provide subsidies for gardening, stormwater management, affordable housing production, any of those things. You have a lot, give it to somebody. And then the last point, we had a homestead plan. It was stripped off the city's, um, we had a new one ready to go to be adopted the green code. Um, at the 11th hour, it was taken off the green code vote. Um, at the same time, the prior homestead plan was deactivated. The strategy as I understand it and told was um, they didn't want the homestead plan to be further used because they wanted to maximize their return for vacant lots and structures because of financial considerations. And so we have this position now where um, we don't have a land disposition strategy codified and uh, we don't have a homestead plan anymore. Um, and so there is a homestead plan that was drafted. It's really, really good. Um, and we've argued and tried to you know, tell Councilmember Nowakowski and Councilmember Rivera um, to resurrect that thing, um, give it a once over and try to push it through so we can, you know, prioritize land disposition um, for, for local needs. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the, you know, sort of dreamy approach that, you know, I, I think is necessary at least, um, you know, I'm not saying that I have all the answers or, you know, all the solutions, but 
Um, I, I can say that you know not having some of these cre critical um, components in your in your quiver as a as a planning office in the city of Buffalo, um, I really think limits the impact that, that the city can have in the neighborhoods where people are really looking for the city or looking to the city to to, to um, initiate some change or incubate some change, some positive change, and not just the, the traditional disinvestment change that we've seen um, through you know through demolitions and vacant lot creation. Um, so that's you know I don't want to keep yammering on and take up more time of everybody's time. Um, but, you know, if anybody has any questions, we'll do them at the end. But if anybody wants to reach out to me on the side, you can catch me um, through my Buff State email account. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty responsive to emails pretty, pretty quickly. Otherwise, the inbox gets too crazy. So, um, so again, thanks for the, the opportunity here and, uh, and, and the ability to sort of contribute to the conversation. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Um, friends, I'm a little uh, uh, nervous that you haven't put a lot of questions in the chat. I have questions. I saw there's a couple in there um, and uh, I, we'll get to them at the end, but um, I know I have some questions. I'm sure you guys have some questions, so put them in the chat so we can um, we can make sure we uh, we get to them at the end, or you can use the Q and A. We're monitoring both, so it doesn't whichever one you're more comfortable with. Um, and now I'm gonna uh, turn the presentation uh, over to Mark. All right, thank you, Jesse. Let me share this screen here. And oops. All right. Can everybody see that? Nope. No? No, it's not showing up yet. Let me try this again here. Oh, there you go. There we go. So, get back to it. Um, okay, so I am super excited with this panel this couldn't have worked out better uh and i think uh you'll you'll really kind of see in my presentation parts of the other two that we just saw so i want to thank brandy and jason because they said set, set me up perfectly um this whole discussion started and i'll get into that um about the street on the east side uh brinkman avenue it's a short street three blocks and uh, it started as an online discussion. Uh, uh, it is everything you just heard. It's the personal stories, uh, the lives that are impacted, the decisions that came down on, on high uh, that didn't involve them. Um, and I, I really just think that'll, that'll work really well. Uh, so hopefully I can include everything because you guys gave me so many ideas now. It's, it's incredible. I think it'll really fit. Um, I have here just on my opening screen, just a, just a brief idea of what this street is. I don't think people have been on it, would know it. There's not a reason to. Um, it's east side. A lot of times people won't realize the quality or diversity uh, on a street like that. Um, there are commercial buildings. There are residential uh, corner stores, schools, churches, all in this little section. And the way it's going to divide out in three blocks is going to, again, just cover everything we just looked at. I, I love it. It worked out so well. So first, why Brinkman Avenue? Um, and so I just wanted to introduce a little of, of what I, uh, what I do, uh, along with, uh, Kevin Hayes. Uh, we maintain this website, Preservation Ready Sites. Uh, that has over 2,000 buildings and growing. Uh, and we prioritize them to buildings in Buffalo that are at risk, that were saved, and that were lost. And if you can see uh, just in the picture, the, our numbers are pretty split uh, across those three. And the idea being to show um, what works here, what didn't work, and what could work. And along with that, there's a Facebook group uh, that's open to the public, preservation ready sites. And that drives a lot of what ends up on the pages uh, as people ask questions or uh, are responding to a new problem. And a few months ago, a woman that I don't think any of us knew made a post, which I included here, 
Does anybody know what happened to the house at 278 Brinkman? My grandparents lived there into the 90s, and I can't find it. And it just, I grew up a few blocks uh, from Brinkman. I went to grammar school on that street. And so she kind of stumbled into the right group to ask, because uh, I've been populating the east side as much as I can and trying to document uh, what I remember and what we're losing so rapidly. And so that kind of started this, uh, this rabbit hole that uh, we dragged everybody into, which I love. So um, for personal stories, this is uh, Susie's grandparents' house uh, in the 1980s and 90s. This is not, um, this is not the 40s or 50s. Uh, this is actually so far east in the city that there wasn't even a demolition threat to this neighborhood throughout really the 1990s. Uh, it wasn't the same as, as Brandy's experience where she was already seeing it because it came in a wave, uh, you know, from urban renewal downtown and didn't hit us. Uh, I really wasn't aware of a lot of it uh, growing up at the time. Uh, things were changing, uh, but not, um, not to this extent, not, not like this. The, they weren't disappearing, there was still a chance. And you can see in this middle uh, section why she couldn't find her grand grandparents' house. Uh, it, along with a few others, are just wiped off, wiped off the map to the point that she couldn't even tell if that house to the left was her grandparents or not. Um, and I had to go parcel by parcel and find uh, where these things are because you just can't tell. Uh, this particular one cost us almost 12000 to demolish. And 12 years after its demolition, the city still owns it, uh, which goes perfectly with what Jason was saying. What is our, what is our plan? Um, uh, what, do, what do we do with this lot? Why did we do that? Um, it, we still have to pay to maintain it. Um, but now there's no opportunity that goes along with that. So uh, I touched briefly on where Brinkman is, but I'll go into it a little bit more here. Uh, we always called it the Walden Bailey or Schiller Park neighborhood, and it's in the Lovejoy Council District. Uh, but the city recently came out with new planning neighborhood designations, which places it in Genesee Moselle. I realize that's not terribly far, but no one in this neighborhood would consider it Genesee Moselle. Uh, and that planning neighborhood also reaches as far as houses into uh, Broadway Fillmore, which certainly would not consider themselves Genesee Moselle. And I mention this solely because it's difficult to even know, um, uh, as Jason alluded to, um, who this affects, um, who's working with the community, where are the plans coming from, where are they disseminating down to, uh, people who are calling for assistance uh, may not even know what uh, what district or neighborhood or planning department they need to talk to uh, about these problems. Uh, I also mentioned it is one of the farthest neighborhoods out. Uh, so uh, a lot of the demolition and uh, disinvestment uh, came at a, um, came last to us, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, but I have here a couple Atlas maps. Uh, this is going to be the three sections of Brinkman we'll go over. And uh, these are the 1894 Atlas. Uh, you can see that the center section is mostly built up already by then, uh, whereas the sides to the south and north uh, are just getting their pieces, uh, primarily uh, Shy Park uh, to the south and Holy Name School and Church, uh, the first iteration going in in the north. Um, there's also commercial um, buildings interspersed mostly at the corners, uh, which are important to the neighborhood as a whole. Um, so the first section of this block um, is from West Shore Railroad uh, to Walden. It's a very short block. They all are. Uh, each, each piece is only going to have about 43 parcels uh, for houses. I took this picture this morning. Uh, you can see uh, uh, versus the 1915 Atlas where it had mostly been populated. So we're looking at a neighborhood that was fully populated and stable for 
a hundred years almost uh, before this comes, maybe even more. Uh, again, I took that photo today, well-maintained houses, trees, um, a mix of renters and owners, um, very strong um, community uh, that we have met with and worked with on uh, certain issues, specifically on this side uh, of Walden. The middle section. Um, here, uh, if you remember from the 1894 map uh, and carried over again in 1915, is the most dense residential. It was established first. It was the center uh, of this street and really almost of this area. Um, and as you'll see as I go on, it was by far the most devastated by demolitions. It's incredible. And then the third part, uh, which is also where uh, Susie's grandparents' house was and uh, Holy Name Church and School, which is a big part uh, of this section, is really a mixed bag. Uh, you'll see in that top corner, that's at Dote. Uh, there's a huge swath of buildings that were taken out before all of this. I suspect uh, before like the five and five plan, but I suspect not much before because uh, those buildings were there as we were uh, living and going to school and everything into the 90s and early 2000s. I can't remember exactly uh, when these would have come down, but it's a recent demo, uh, but there's a reason that kind of 2007 will be our dividing line. The other two pictures, uh, if you look at the middle, the largest image are some large, gorgeous buildings. Uh, again, that picture is from this morning. Uh, they could use a couple trees, but they are just wonderful and they are there and they are uh, owner occupied. And, uh, and then in that bottom corner there, you see the one house left um, with lots on either side, which is gonna be a, a big part of, um, of the problem uh, with demolitions here. And I'm glad that Jason got into it the way he did because they chase vacancy numbers. Um, but do you want to live in that house in the middle and should you invest in it? Uh, and what is the draw to being there? Uh, if that's what's going to surround you. Uh, and typically what we saw, like he said, it may look targeted now because large swaths are taken out, but it went house by house and, all that did was chase out the incentive to uh, to further invest if you even could get uh, funding to do so. So again, as we've talked about, uh, the 2000s were a real turning point in a number of ways uh, for Brinkman, especially. Uh, the mayor comes in in 2005. Uh, the next year, the diocese decided to close Holy Name. Uh, a large number of the residents in that area uh, either went to the church or sent their kids to the school uh, or work, did maintenance there, um, and everything that goes with it, you know, Boy Scouts and bingo programs and, um, and just eyes on the street at all times, there's activity. Um, pieces of it had been sold off already. The school had closed earlier, but they were still using it. Uh, there was a, a rectory and few other places were, were starting to be used for housing. Um, and then uh, the following year, 2007, comes the five-year plan for demolitions. It's also the first year that we have Google Street Image uh, views, um, which is a coincidence, but it's real helpful for me because a lot of these got wiped off before any of us knew what was coming. And so there was just no reason to take all of these pictures of all these random places and then they were gone. And uh, so I'd love to be able to look back and, and backdate it a little more, but that's kind of our starting line uh, because I can tell for sure what was going on. And then again, the following year to, <laughs> to just pile on uh, was the mortgage crisis. So if you look here in the chart, um, between 1894, I know houses were built before then, but that's as soon as I can tell, uh, up until the five for five plan, there were somewhere between 18 and 27 de demolitions on the street. Very hard to tell for sure, because I don't know if every available parcel was built on, um, or if it was already designated for commercial use and has always just been a parking lot or, or something like that, 
or somebody has a side lot. And uh, so some of it's a little hard to tell uh, tracking a hundred years, but you get the idea that, that we're talking about a very small number over a uh, hundred years. And then in the subsequent 13 years, we have 26, which is as much as my high estimate for the century before it. And even more narrow of a band is within that five-year window uh, where we got 21 of them just on this one uh, three-block radius. Uh, and just for the picture on the right, uh, it's kind of a good uh, kind of a good view of what people were living with there. Um, well, a very nice maintained house uh, with a tree and a boarded up vacant house right next to it. Um, it may have been a problem at a time, but I'm willing to bet uh, that, that the vacant lot uh, is a much more permanent problem now than that house was. So we have these three sections of this street. Uh, and I say it's the same street, but very different existence. Um, prior to uh, this uh, policy beginning, each, each section of uh, the street had a nearly identical amount of available residential parcels at the top 43 43 and 41 couldn't have worked out better for me um, and then I included the houses that were still standing there and the number of vacant lots uh, and the percentage there just shows shows the difference uh, of all available places where a house could be how many places do we actually have a house uh, you can see on the west shore to Walden and the uh, road to Dilt um, both similar in that 80% range, which isn't bad. Uh, again, I think Road to Dote um, had just recently lost a few. Uh, so I'm willing to bet that number was higher if I went back a few years. But the stunning part is that Walden to Row, there is only one vacant lot on that entire parcel. It 98% were houses, which is how I remember it walking to school. It was a house everywhere, extremely dense. And now, um, this is a lot of numbers to take in. I included it mostly, um, you know, just so you can look back at it uh, later. But the key point is of the uh, 26, 27 demolitions that happened, one of the parcels had two houses on it, which is the discrepancy in number. Um, 19 of them happened in that stable center section. And it went down from 98% full of houses to just 53%. Um, combined, there was just shy of $400,000 in demolition applied to this street. Um, and you can see uh, for, for percentages of demo houses, uh, you know, it was 3% in West Shore to Walden. They only lost one house in, in the same range. They lost one house and they lost it to fire um versus 19 the next block over and uh, going into this i thought that possibly the only reason that one side would be protected and the other wasn't was perhaps owner occupancy because as i said i know the west shore to walden section has a very good uh community uh organization but when i check those numbers they're all uh i mean it's slightly higher uh in the area um West Shore to Walden, but mostly all 40% owner occupied. So the decision made, uh, which I believe Jason pointed to, was not of planning, but of convenience. So this middle section, this is how it would have looked. Uh, these were the available parcels. The two, uh, the two in orange uh, are the commercial buildings on Walden. Everything else was a residential parcel full of houses. You see that there was only 161 was missing. And I tried to just show where the owner occupants were. Uh, it's spaced, um, it spaced out pretty well across the middle. And in really just five years from this point, you get that. Um, and they all happen two here, six here, three here. But just think of, uh, you know, someone like uh, 188 there who may be an owner occupant is just surrounded by fields a few years after they had a complete neighborhood. It had to have been shocking. 
So here I tried to just show a little aerial of kind of what's going on as a as a broader picture. Uh, the way I say uh, these demolitions work or that Buffalo turns temporary problems into permanent ones. Certainly not just Buffalo, uh, Cleveland and Detroit, among others, have gotten just destroyed by this. Um, but this is the city we got, or what we have left of it. Um, so the section in the red, uh, in the middle, is that middle section of uh, Brinkman. Uh, as you can see in the aerial now, it's uh, there's less than half of it left. Uh, but what's equally as weird about it and how you can tell there's no plan is if you look at the two sections in green uh, in the upper right and then that kind of triangular region uh, at the bottom, um, they're nearly full, uh, especially the upper right. Uh, it's just wonderful houses and, and they're all there. Uh, and what we've often been told about why these demolitions happened is that they couldn't imagine that anybody would ever want these houses. But clearly, even in the same neighborhood at the same time, um, people wanted the houses next door. Um, but as a result, uh, and as you can see, the demolitions were scattershot uh, in a circle pattern around Brinkman as well, uh, up to the top and left, um, the neighborhood loses half of its population, half of its housing stock. Uh, commercial buildings are either demoed or now vacant um, because and the local grocery store just closed uh, and I have to think in part because you need a certain amount of density to maintain that and uh, it's also difficult to fund a new project if you wanted to do uh, a rehab or a new build um, you're looking at $250,000 in an area that houses maybe, according to Zillow, uh, average about $50,000. Uh, and so it's very difficult to get banks to work with you on anything or to get developers here. Developers would rather knock something down on Elmwood to build something in its place than to come to this free vacant land and, uh, and build. And the last thing I want to mentioned with this slide, um, you know, they're chasing that vacancy rate, which obviously didn't work. But there are things that didn't change here. You, they didn't wipe this neighborhood off the map. So all the roads still need to be paved, all the sewers, utilities, street lights, any police, fire, uh, sidewalk maintenance, any of that, every cost that the city had is still there. Uh, on top of that, now we not add in uh, what we had to pay to demolish it, uh, what we have to pay to cut the lawns, uh, what we should be paying to uh, shovel the sidewalks, but no one's doing, and the opportunity cost of those losses. Uh, those were assets. Uh, if vacant lots are assets, houses are definitely assets. Uh, but only if you look at it in a bigger picture than your five-year return on investment. That's just not the way a city should plan. Again, a lot here. A little bit of funny math here. Um, I, it's not. It's not that. It's. It's no more of a projection than than our usual city budgets or their vacancy rates, which also failed. Uh, I just wanted to give an idea. You always hear about, uh, you know, when you bring up preservation. Well, who's going to pay for it? Uh, and you never hear about what it's costing you to demolish. So in the top line, uh, no matter what, we know for certain uh, that they also, they had released uh, permit information back to 2007, which is also lined up well for this. We know it cost almost $400,000 to do what they did to this street. Now, if those, uh, again, I list 25 houses here because one was already gone and one uh, was a double house, but 25, nice round number. If those 25 houses had been boarded, secured, uh, I mean, you're talking an average of $15,000 a house. You could do quite a lot with, with that or less for most of them. Um, and then I just gave a range here of if they had sold for 5,000 to 12,500 or 20,000, uh, how much the city would have gotten back on those sales. They may have had to wait a few years on them, but they're waiting on vacant lots right now. So it's no different. Uh, if you go to any, uh, if you go to the tax auction each year now, you'll see that Houses recommended for demolition have 10 bids on them and easily go up to 15 or 20,000 or more 
uh, and there's a real shortage and a full room of guys that uh, are trying to get them, guys and girls. Um, so those are good, good range, 100 to $500,000 lost just in sitting on them for five or 10 years. Uh, and I understand uh, the issues with that, but uh, you got to know that at the end of that, this is what you could have made. And then each of those houses would pay tax every year, uh, which is a big part of this and why it makes the numbers not as important as how long you're willing to wait for your return. Uh, I picked three levels here, 250. Uh, I actually bought a house off the demolition list uh, in the neighborhood that they had started demolishing. Taxes are about 250 a year on that. Uh, and at the high range, I picked uh, our house in a historic district and uh, around what we're, we're, we're seeing now. Uh, so reasonable numbers for what this neighborhood could have been. And over the 15 years we've already lost, I understand we wouldn't have gotten everybody in on that, but it's any 15 years. That's what those numbers look like. Uh, again, one to $500,000 in, in potential tax revenue. And, and I extend this out to 30 or 50 years uh, because that's the point. This neighborhood was here for a hundred years. It could be here for another hundred. The, the numbers don't matter so much as that you see what it could become. Uh, the total losses, um, in just 15 years could have been a half a million to a million and a half. And the farther you go, um, the better this could have done to pay for all those services that you still have to maintain for the residents that are left here. Uh, and I, I think in this, no one would look at this block or these this small little area and think of it in terms of millions of dollars. I don't think the scale uh, matches up uh, when you hear it. So. Uh, that, that's all I'm trying to show here is just what we lost in just one sliver, just one. I mean, this is, there were 3,500 demolitions. This is 25 of them. Uh, so you can imagine the impact of that. And, uh, I, I regret that this conclusion is as grim as it is, but this is how I remember it. Uh, my buddy lived in that second house there. Uh, this is the same view. Um, same view five years apart. There was so much lost potential there. Um, ev everything was still there. And to start over now to build new uh, is very difficult, is very expensive. And frankly, it's not gonna be as good as what was there. And so as Jason mentioned, um, you have to figure out what you're gonna do with this. Uh, the lower section of uh, Brinkman did uh, very well surrounding themselves around Shy Park. And uh, maybe that's what this middle section needs to be now. Uh, we have to get creative with it uh, to make it an amenity for who's there, to make you want to move back, to invest in your house while you are there. And um, I just, I hope we can, we can get a visual like this, uh, like Brandy said before that, you know, we're still in these neighborhoods and it's important to include everyone who's in there. Um, we're still fighting. We still want uh, a great place to live and we can still have it. Uh, so I'll try to make it a little nicer than the, than the grim image, but uh, that's, that is my presentation. I'm on, I'm not unmuted now. Um, all right, thanks, Mark, so much. I really appreciate all the time and care and attention you put into that. And um, yeah, for those of you who weren't watching this unfold uh, live over Facebook, <laughs> which is how this kind of came together, Mark was almost doing this analysis uh, 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 in an open source way while we were all kind of sitting there um, watching. So I really appreciate all the panelists and all of your time and all of your very different um, perspectives uh, tonight. Um, and I, we don't have a ton of time left, so I'm going to get through a couple quick questions. Um, and then um, Steve Carnath just put in the chat, the always brilliant uh, Steve Carnath, that we need to have a follow-up uh, panel. So yes, uh, Steve, um, uh, we'll do that. Uh, I will commit that to you and uh, we'll put you on that panel and we'll talk about it. So just a couple um, uh, quick um, uh, uh, questions. Um, Jason, the map that you showed of the demolitions, was that all demolitions during that time period or was that um, only the five and five demolitions? Yeah, so there's 
sort of two, there's two maps, right? So this first map is the map of the demolitions undertaken in the five and five program. Um, you know, and just the statistical uh, analysis of the pattern. And then the second isn't demolitions per se, it's vacant lots. And so we're making a leap in logic that the vast majority of these vacant lots are the result of some form of structural demolition. Um, and also the assumption that the vast majority of that is publicly funded. Cool, thank you for that clarification. And then Lori had a great question in the Q&A as well. Um, you know, you talk about how you see demolition as a necessary component um, of a city planning process, but that it needs to be more strategic. And Lori was wondering if you have examples of where you, of cities, um, where you think that has been successfully done, where they've used a strategic demolition program to result in um, lower vacancy and higher quality of life in communities. Yeah, I think that that just the sort of perfect example doesn't, in my mind, really exist. And I think I might have responded to Lori that, you know, it's, I've been about three years since I've been out of the demo work a lot, but you know, what you typically have is this idea that demo, like if you look in the academic literature, demolitions are never fun, right? Because they're just considered to be this sort of necessary evil in public policy, and no one's really ever thought about them in a really strategic manner. Um, and so a lot of the sort of Rust Belt shrinking cities have just, the issue piled up and they just have always done it this way. And so the idea that like a Baltimore or Buffalo or St. Louis or Milwaukee would step back um, after demolishing thousands of units and try to rethink it just doesn't really happen. You get some of the maybe bits and pieces of strategy used in certain places, like, you know, working with across, you know, sort of silos to try to get people involved in, in the decision making process. There's really no, as far as I can tell, um, you know, sort of shining example of what one would be. Okay. Um, well, that's helpful to know. Um, and then, um, there's a, a lot of chatting in the um, in the chat box about the homestead, um, the revised homestead program that you were mentioning. So I don't know if that's something you feel. You know, there were a bunch of questions on that. People just asking like, what are the changes or what do you see as the the issues with that? Do you want to take that quickly or? Yeah, do you I mean, I, I think the simple answer on the demo or on the homestead plan is it can be literally lifted up and adopted by the council at any moment. The, the draft version of the Green Code's homestead plan um, was awesome. And it was, I mean, awesome in terms of like markedly better than what was there before. And I think I, I responded that one of, the, um, one of the, the key strategies was it increased the geography within which um, lots and structures were eligible. The old homestead plan was really confined to very small geographies in large parts of the city that the homestead plan should have been active, would have been active in the new plan. So it would have opened up a larger part of the city for homesteading and, and access to properties and lots. And I think that would have been helpful, but the city didn't want that. I think they pulled back because they recognized the financial constraints they were under and they would rather just sell them to the highest bidder than to open basically what was in the entire city to $1 sale. And maybe um, if that draft is available, we could, um, if, if that, if someone has that draft or we have that draft available, if it's something that you're working on with other council members, I'm sure it's something that our participants here tonight would love to see. We could email that out to the registration, registrants. Yeah, I, I think I might have a close to final copy, but there might be a copy floating around in the one region forward planning library. Okay. But they may have pulled it uh, for anyone they, who doesn't know it. They might have pulled it out of there if it was ever there. But, um, but yeah, I can look if somebody sends me an email reminder. I might have a, I might have a, it was privy to drafts, and I think I might have gotten a final draft. Um, well, it's just past 830 and um, I know I want to be mindful and respectful. We told everybody we'd be done at 830 and we've definitely lost a couple participants who, um, you know, were probably strict to that 830 time. Um, but if you, um, if you don't mind uh, my asking um, a question, um, which is with the numbers, with, you know, basically, uh, if I heard you correctly, from 2000 to 2010, we decreased about 33,000 housing units in the city. 
but we still have the same 15% vacancy rate, um, essentially. Um, and then we can't point to a good city where there's been a really robust um, uh, plan where you know you feel like this this as a city building strategy has worked. So I am curious, like why you know why we think this may you know there needs to be this kind of um, large scale demolition and how would you differentiate that? And I think Mike Puma asked that in the chat. Kind of how would you differentiate what you're talking about in terms of a very large scale strategic demolition from what happened under urban renewal? Yeah, so urban renewal was sort of codified demolition, but it didn't it didn't have the same like level of strategy, right? So the problem with urban renewal was it allowed local governments to define slum and blight as they saw it, not as it was defined. So it didn't have a sort of universal defini definition of what slum and blight was. And that became a really slippery tool for local governments to essentially identify areas where they wanted development to happen and areas that they didn't. So in, you know, they took over essentially low quality stuff near downtown that downtown landowners were complaining about, made it shovel ready, and then turned around and sold it to those same downtown landowners for pennies on the dollar, right? So the strategic demolition strategy in that, and the difference is that that didn't really include rank and file residents and stakeholders, the people that were affected. What we're, what we're saying, what Malik says is, listen, if you're going to do the demolition, it looks a lot like urban renewal, but without the sort of big umbrella that it's under, that it should then, in, in theory, really connect to the people that are impacted by it, rather than sort of just sort of devolving the impact to the to the people beneath them. So here, solve this problem, you're, you're going to have all these vacant lots. So the idea that, that there is some strategy um, should have been the way it should would be done. Detroit came up with a plan and it sort of uh, codified demolition strategy in 2014, but you know, it's too late, right? I mean, like the damage is done. The damage is done in Buffalo. Like, I don't know that a strategic demolition strategy right now is 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 the is the answer. I think maybe the answer is really getting back in and doing some repair. Um, and what does repair look like? Because, you know, as Mark sort of alluded to, the 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 and now you know I sort of push back on Mark's point about the the big ifs that he presented in this sort of piece. There, the reality is we did another paper called. Um, they focus on sort of what we call a dead zone, like this large part of the east side where Mark says, oh, well, people will buy units. You couldn't give them away at the auction, right? So what we see now is this, under the psychology of the resurgence narrative, we saw a lot of people from outside the region flood in here and buy up properties because they were reading that this place was resurgent, right? But when you really look at it on the east side, even in recent, even in our most recent auction, which I think was 19, there was still a big hole in the middle of the east side where you literally could not give away properties for 500 bucks, right? So in those cases, my point is in those cases, you need to reconcile that reality with a strategy and that strategy is probably demolition, right? If you can't give it something away for $500, at what point do you say, listen, we have to, we got to take this down, right? So I'm not saying take everything down everywhere all the time. And I don't think preservation is say we should save everything everywhere all the time. I'm saying, those two sort of polar opposite concepts have to meet in the middle where we build on community values and assets to, to arrive at a solution that repairs the problem. The demolition strategy is long past something that we can sort of fix. And I think you got a, there was a lot of positive chatter in the chat box that you may not have gotten to see about this concept of neighborhood planning and doing planning, uh, you know, at a at a more neighborhood level. Those of you who know me and my background know that I got my start in Seattle at the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods when they were implementing their comprehensive plan through a very close to the ground um, system of neighborhood planning uh, work that was tied to the budget, that was tied to all kinds of um, incentives for participatory planning. Um, and so I think you're seeing a lot of positive um, positive chat. And um, actually, <laughs> again, you can tell Mike Puma is uh, on my board. I'm going to let you jump in here, Mark, um, but uh, was just uh, meeting with a city code official this morning about what would an actual mothballing um, component of the of the city code look like and how could we start to incorporate that. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time, but Mark, I do want to let you jump in here. And then I might give Brandy the last word before we say goodnight. So we'll go Mark and then we'll go Brandy and then we'll, we'll say goodnight to our friends. Uh, perfect. I'll, I'll be quick. I just want to speak a little bit more to, to Jason's point and I, I'm glad he brought it up and... <laughs> 
Yep. Uh, All your cats, I, I, to settle down. I knew it would be a. I knew it would be an important part of this, so I'm glad I get to talk about it a little more. The $500 is a good number. That is what they offer almost all uh, vacant residential lots. The commercials go for more. Uh, those you go through pages and pages and pages and no one buys them because you can't build on them. Uh, you can't find them. You can't tell what's different about them. You're never going to find funding uh, to put a house there. And anybody who's building a new $250,000, $300,000 house in West Seneca is not looking at Brinkman. Uh, it doesn't matter what you give it away for. But the houses, <clears throat> those get fought over. And they weren't, uh, they weren't. Uh, in 2005, 2010, even, uh, they weren't. Uh, but now they are. And I think it just would have taken some foresight on the city to understand the intrinsic value of it rather than the paper value of it that day. And uh, because now I've seen fights happen between 15 bidders on a house that they're saying is demo uh, up for demolition. And they actually had to pull the auction because they got word that the demolition was happening right now as the guys were bidding on the house. Uh, that's how um, that was the interest to it. Uh, as you remove the um, as you remove the supply and as time goes on, uh, these dynamics change, and I don't think we were prepared for it being worth it. I also think there's a large contingent that their understanding of who would bid on this house is that a white guy whose parents lived there in the 50s will not buy there now. But that is not who's buying these houses, and uh, that's not who they needed to be thinking about. Um, if they come back, great. Uh, more power to you. A diverse neighborhood is wonderful. Um, but we were seeing uh, a much more diverse group of people uh, in that room in the auction. So that's it. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Brandy, you want to close us out and then I'll, I'll, I'll maybe end it and talk about some next steps with this. Sure. Um, I just want to continue to remind everyone, um, just from a resident level, um, someone who's, you know, had boots on the ground and just operating from a very organic place um, to help uplift the community, um, to keep in mind that leadership, um, technical skills, um, and keeping our, men, our millennials um, is, is what's important. To, to the community and building back up the community that are seeking home ownership, um, supporting the small community organizations who envision uh, remaining and growing and building neighborhoods. Um, I believe um, my motivation uh, to bring back the vibrancy of the neighborhood of the Fruit Belt um, is still there, but again, we need that continued support. Um, so this vision is sustainable through leadership and economic development. Thanks, Brandy. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of our panelists so much. This is a really different panel than obviously you're used to from PBN. And I want to thank Jason for, you know, coming into the lion's den. He must have said about eight times when we were discussing this, you know, I'm not a preservationist. And, um, you know, I think I think that's okay. And I think we want to have more conversations um, between the folks who are driving urban planning policy and, and between the folks who are in neighborhoods trying to figure out how do we make sense of this? How, how do we, um, how do we move forward? Um, and so I think we're just at a really interesting inflection point in our city on a number of different levels. And I just want to thank Mark and Brandy and Jason for coming and having this really detailed, really, um, you know, really different conversation um, than maybe you're used to seeing from PBN. And um, I, I appreciate all of you guys for um, hanging with us uh, tonight and talking about it. And um, absolutely, we will do a follow up panel. And I think that's a great idea. And we can figure out what that looks like and, and how to do that next. And then I just am going to recommend a book really quick um, for those of you who want to think more about this issue. And uh, it's called Root Shock. And it's by um, uh, Dr. Mindy Thompson Fullilove, F-U-L-L-I-L-O-V-E. Um, and she's a clinical psychiatrist who got really interested in um, the effects of displacement on people's mental and, and physical health and has done a number of deep dives in Pittsburgh and Newark um, and other places um, around the issue of displacement and larger scale uh, neighborhood demolition. And so if you're interested in reading a little bit more about that from 
from a preservationist perspective. <laughs> um, that's my recommended reading for you this evening. But again, Jason, thank you so much. Brandy, you're really wonderful. Mark, as always, it's a pleasure to hang out with you. And um, and thanks to everyone tonight who tuned in. This is amazing turnout for um, this discussion. I hope everybody goes away with a lot to think about and um, a lot to do, frankly. So there's a lot to do. And I'm, I'm grateful to have um, folks as smart and committed um, as these folks to do it with. So thanks everybody so much. And we will, we did record this. We will throw it up on our YouTube. Um, so just check back in the next couple of days for that if you wanna, um, if you, if you wanna see anything again. So um, thank thanks you. everybody. Thank you.